This video was brought to you by Nebula. Hello friends, my name is JJ, and today I thought it might be fun to do a third entry in my award-winning video series, Your City Isn't Unique. This is when we look at things in American cities that people who live there often like to imagine makes their city all quirky and special, but is actually an incredibly common thing that can be found in cities all across this continent. Like, for example, the rug store that claims to have been going out of business for 20 straight years. All right, so let's just get into it. So the first thing I want to talk about is something that a lot of you guys mentioned in the comments of my last video, wacky TV commercials from some goofy local businessman. In my experience, these sorts of ads, which are especially common for car dealers, furniture salesmen, and lawyers, tend to be the subject of extreme sentimentality by people in their cities, with the wacky businessmen in question often held up as these Extremely eccentric and unusual characters. Guys so unapologetically shameless and silly that they're willing to throw all of the standard rules of how a TV ad should work out the window and just embrace being a big cringy goofball. My name's Danny C, ain't nobody killer. AKA the rapping car dealer. Up in South Houston with two locations. And in a way, don't we all gotta hand it to them for at least having the courage to be themselves. It reminds me a lot of a phenomenon that we discussed in one of the earlier videos, where every city tends to have several beloved local crackpots who wander the streets dressed in some bizarre getup or doing some bizarre stunt. And everyone is like, ho ho ho, only in Milwaukee. But let me tell you a, a secret about these wacky TV pitchmen. Not only are they extremely common, many of them are shockingly uncreative. When crazy Alfonso goes on TV dressed as a surgeon and says his prices are so low he's committing malpractice, chances are high he is probably working off a script that he purchased from a company that specializes in helping small businesses make highly memorable low-budget ads. And since there aren't that many of these companies out there, this means that if you travel around the US and Canada and hang out in enough different cities, you will almost certainly wind up seeing multiple different versions of the same wacky ad just starring different local businessmen. The rise of the internet has helped raise popular awareness of this unglamorous reality like never before. John Oliver did an episode of Last Week Tonight all about scripted car dealership ads. Some of them looked suspiciously similar. I'm in a pickle. My doctor told me to turn it down a notch before my heart explodes. And I'm in a pickle. My doctor told me to calm down before my heart explodes. Steve Johnson here from Zumbrota Ford. My doctor told me to turn it down a notch so my heart doesn't explode. While my Nebula buddy Illegal Eagle did a whole video talking about the many, many TV lawyers who all call themselves The Hammer. I'm attorney Daryl Isaacs, The Hammer. My name is Bradley Dworkin. The Illinois Hammer. Lowell, the Hammer Stanley. It's obviously pretty uncanny when you see a bunch of these ads in a row, but on some level it just makes sense, right? Like, there's no logical reason to assume that some small-time local businessman would be any good at making funny ads, let alone that this skill would be common among them. I personally think it does a disservice to people who make ads for a living when we assume that a memorable commercial is something that any random middle-aged dad selling used minivans can slap together on the force of his personality alone. And speaking of car dealerships, how about the one in your city with the really giant flag out front? I remember when I was growing up, there was this one car dealership on the outskirts of my city that my father would always confidently insist had the biggest Canadian flag in the world. But then, one day, when I was visiting Ontario, a friend drove me past a car dealership in some smaller town out there, and he confidently insisted that this place, in fact, had the biggest flag in Canada. And I have since learned that this is actually a very old gimmick among car dealerships that dates back to at least the 1970s. All across the US and Canada, usually in communities relatively far from major population centers, you will reliably find car lots with a giant pole out front bragging about how they have a flag of a size that is noteworthy in some qualified way, like the biggest flag in the county, or the biggest flag in the region, or one of the country's largest continuously flying flags, what 
whatever that means. And of course, over time, people like my dad just forget about those qualifiers and just call it the biggest flag, full stop. There is no logical reason for this gimmick. It's a lot like the goofy TV ads. Selling cars is a very competitive, but also very boring business. So dealerships have a lot of incentive to use wacky novelties to attract an otherwise indifferent public. I prefer those floppy tube men myself. All right, so I think most of us know that having a county fair or some sort of other big yearly outdoor summer festival thing isn't particularly unique to any specific place. But what continues to baffle me is how many cities think that their festival thing is particularly unique because it has mini donuts. Mini donuts have got to be the most overly sentimentalized festival food out there, with a close second being some sort of weird deep fried thing like a candy bar or an Oreo. A ridiculous number of fairs claim that their donuts are even world famous, despite the fact that many of them just buy their donut goo from some big national retailer and fry them up using an automated process, not exactly leaving a lot of room for unique culinary flair. My sense is that this whole legend is simply a byproduct of mini donuts being a novelty food that's only ever eaten in one very particular context that also tends to be a context that people rarely experience in cities outside of their own. The social phenomenon of being sheltered from natural exposure to the sort of information that might shatter the myth, in other words, which basically describes most of what we are talking about today. Now, here is something that really blew my mind when I first heard it, because I thought for sure this was just a Vancouver thing. Whenever you go on a tour of the campus of the University of British Columbia, the tour guide will always stop at the library and tell you this funny story about how the library is slowly sinking into the earth because the dopey architect forgot to plan for the weight of all of the books. I have since learned that this is in fact an incredibly, incredibly common story that tour guides all across this continent tell about university libraries, but it isn't true. The Snopes people actually have an entire page about the sinking library myth where they note, though a few libraries have experienced settling problems, none of them was the result of an addle-brained architect who left out the key calculation regarding the weight of the library's holdings. They conclude that this myth survives in part because it is a whimsical metaphor about the burdens of knowledge and the limits of expertise, as opposed to because it's, you know, true. History in general is a common source of these sorts of myths of city uniqueness. For example, I remember growing up to revere the great fire that burned down the old capital of British Columbia, New Westminster, back in 1898. They had big murals about it and everything. But of course, a ton of major American cities experienced big fires in the late 19th to early 20th centuries, simply because buildings were made of a lot more flammable materials in those days, and before electricity became widespread, people lived around a lot more open flames than we now know is probably Safe. Another one is this idea of some historic figure in the town being called the Hangin' Judge. I feel like whenever you go on a historic walking tour of some part of North America that was settled during the era of westward expansion, the guide will always tell you some story of some tough but eccentric law and order type who dominated the community in the early days, and they all called him the hanging judge because he loved executing people. And then everybody is like, oh ho, what a grim, but in some ways hilarious time the past was. This one, as far as I can tell, is just an example of a generic term that was once used to describe a general type of bloodthirsty judge that was then gradually misunderstood by a bunch of different people in various parts of America who came to believe it referred to one specific judge in particular. The Oxford English Dictionary, however, identifies it as a generic phrase whose first documented use occurred in 1847 and not in reference to any actual historical figure. Okay. 
Now, let us talk about some more general city characteristics. You may recall that a while ago, I made a video in which I analyzed tourism ads from all 50 states. And going through that process made me realize that a lot of major American cities are a lot more alike than they probably realize in terms of what they think makes them worth visiting, with a major one being their proximity to nature. Since we live on a giant, mostly empty continent with a very low population density, it is really quite unusual for a major North American city to not be within relatively short driving distance to some sort of nature type area. Be it the woods, the mountains, a lake, the ocean, whatever you call this kind of place. And yet I have found that something people continue to be unduly proud of is how when you're in their city, you are so close to nature. A lot of people seem to be under the impression that most cities are like these infinite jungles of concrete from which there is no escape. Sort of like that scene in Inception, which in turn makes a city that is in any sort of reasonable proximity to nature some sort of breathtaking marvel of geography. Oh, we are so lucky here. You can go for a hike in the morning and still be back in town in time for lunch. And before you go for your hike, maybe you could even buy some supplies at the giant camping supply store that is also run as some sort of collectivist hippie co-op for some reason. But if you do go on a nature adventure, be prepared to go alone because have you ever noticed how hard it is to make friends here? Like people in this city are just so cold and unfriendly, you know? If your city is anything like mine, and I know it is, the supposedly unfriendly character of your city has been the subject of endless articles in the local paper, as well as countless 800 word Facebook posts from some friend of your sister. Maybe the mayor has even suggested creating a special day where everyone wears a name tag to incentivize people to be more chatty. I think that started off as a Seinfeld joke, but cities actually do it now. But anyway, this is another example of how people tend to anthropomorphize cities, assuming they have distinct personalities like people determined by some sort of inherent deep-seated city character, as opposed to the fact that it's a city. Cities, by definition, have large populations and are full of anxious, hardworking people, including non-resident commuters and people who have moved to the city recently to pursue new opportunities. And this inevitably fosters a culture in which, at any given time, most of the city's residents are relatively distracted and disinterested in one another for purely practical reasons, but nevertheless breeds mutually reinforcing feelings of loneliness and alienation. I will concede that some cities are more self-pitying about this inescapable reality than others, but I would honestly be curious to know if there is any city in North America that claims to be friendlier than most without also attributing said friendliness to the fact that they are also smaller than most of the others. It's so nice living here because even though we're a city, in a lot of ways it feels more like a small town. And lastly, let us talk about shopping. So you know that one weird part of your city where there's a bunch of wedding dress stores in a row for some reason? Yeah, we all have that. People are often pretty weirded out by the idea of their city having a wedding district, especially since the wedding district is often located in a relatively scummy or at least unglamorous part of town, often quite far from the downtown core. Luxury car dealerships are often a similar story. They also tend to be packed pretty tightly together and located in an otherwise unimpressive, isolated part of the city. But this just reflects a popular economics theory known as Hotelling's Law, which posits that the ideal place for a vendor to sell his product is as close as possible to his competitor, since that puts you in the best position to be the rebound for customers if the first store fails to impress. This is actually a very common principle when it comes to business locations. We just tend to notice it less when it involves restaurants or clothing stores because we're numb to seeing those kinds of places. The reason wedding dress or luxury car stores tend to be located in weird parts of town meanwhile, is simply because people don't buy those things very often, making them so-called destination shopping, which is to say they are selling products that people need very rarely, but are also special enough that the customer is willing to inconvenience herself to get them. So stores that sell destination goods often take advantage of this fact by locating themselves in parts of town where the rent is cheap, 
even if the neighborhood isn't great. And it doesn't really matter because the vibe of a neighborhood tends to have a greater impact on more impulsive shopping. Making the purchase of a $6,000 dress you will wear once in your life, a decision affected by a slightly different set of variables than, say, buying a croissant. And speaking of cheap things to buy, how about buying a subscription to today's video sponsor, Nebula. And what is Nebula, you ask? Well, so you know YouTube, right? That place where people post videos of giant popsicles and things? Well, what if I was to tell you that there is a site out there that is just like YouTube, but it has no ads, and instead of popsicle videos, it has a ton of high quality educational and commentary content from all of your favorite egghead creators. We're talking people like Legal Eagle, Knowing Better, Wendover Productions, Polymatter, TLDR News, Climate Town, Practical Engineering, and more. And what if I was to tell you that this site also contains early videos, extended cuts, and exclusive content from all of those same creators, like Real Life Lore's 50 minutes special on the Turkish-Kurdish conflict? And what if this theoretical site even included content from noted Canadian crackpot creator JJ McCullough? Well, surely you would say that I must be telling some horrible, horrible lie. But no, it is true, such a miraculous site does exist, and you can find it at nebula.tv. But it must certainly cost a fortune, right? Well, wrong again, because if you click on the link in the thing below, you can get unlimited access to all of the nebula goodness for the rock bottom price of only $2.50 a month. That is cheaper than what I paid for this terrible bag of chips. And surely expanding your mind is worth more than a bag of chips, right? Nebula, because knowledge is more important than chips. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed hearing about all of the ways that your city still isn't unique. If you haven't already, please check out parts one and two of this series. And be sure to let me know in the comments if you can think of any other things that sheltered people think makes their city special, but actually doesn't. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next week.